Hello and greetings everyone. Once again, I would like to welcome you here at Class Kirby. My name is Jonas and I will be your lecturer for this online discussion where we are already in our season 2 where we talk about pharmacology and its application to the nursing practice. For this discussion, we will specifically be tackling about antimicrobial medication. <coughs> For the objectives of today's discussion, we would like to gain understanding about the mechanisms of action for specific antimicrobial agent. Number two is for us to identify common antimicrobial medications used here in the hospital or in our Philippine setup. We also would like to gain comprehensions with, uh, comprehension with regards to the therapeutic effects and possible adverse reactions of different antimicrobial medication. And lastly, we would like to categorize each different antimicrobial. Allow me to start by defining what chemotherapy is. Well, the word chemotherapy is commonly associated with the treatment of cancer. However, the word chemotherapy in a strict sense is simply the utilization of any drugs for the purpose of curing a disease. With that said, I would like you to remember that all drugs are chemicals that can affect the living process. But then again, for this subject, we will be focusing on those chemicals that will have physiologic effects beneficial to our clients. When we talk about antimicrobial agents, we are simply referring to drugs that will be able to answer or cater an infectious disease, basically by two major principles by killing microorganisms or by inhibiting their growth. Well, most of the times, the word antibiotics and antimicrobials are used interchangeably. However, as what was discussed a while ago, antimicrobial medications are any drug that can somewhat inhibit or kill a growth of a particular microorganism. However, antibiotics specifically or strictly speaking is any substance produced by a particular microorganism that might hinder the growth of another organism aside from itself. Due to the advancements in the field of pharmacology, however, a lot of antibiotics that are considered to be semi-synthetic have been developed, wherein they are able to cover a broader array of microbes as well as reduce the perceived side effects of those that are naturally produced by microorganisms. I would like you to understand that in order for antibacterial or antimicrobial medications to effectively combat a particular condition, there are several factors that might contribute to its efficiency or efficacy. Number one will be the innate ability of the body to combat a disease, wherein uh, we can term it as our immunity. When we talk about immunity, there are basically two kinds of immunity. Number one will be innate immunity, which is the immunity that we are born with, and your adaptive immunity, which was developed due to several factors, one of which is exposure to a particular disease, and the other will be, well, vaccines and the like. Also, you have environmental, environmental sanitation, which is specifically highlighted in Nightingale's environmental theory, wherein she stated that the environmental cleanliness or sanitation has a direct relation with regards to the effective, uh, timely healing of a particular client. There are several factors that we need to consider in order to classify if a particular antimicrobial agent is considered, well, ideal or suitable or good for that matter. Number one is that it should either inhibit or kill the growth of a particular pathogen. Number two, while it's targeting the pathogen, it should not cause significant damage to the host cell. Kasi aanhin natin, kung napatay mo nga yung pathogen, but then you have also caused significant damage to the tissues of the body, then by all means, it's not considered to be good enough. Next will be, it's not enough to cause severe allergic reactions. When we talk about allergies, 
These are basically antigen, antibody responses of the body. So, dapat pagka tinitake ng client, it will not be able to cause significant results or adverse reactions that might be considered, well, uh, physiologically detrimental to our clients. Number four is that it can be stored on uh, a stable manner. Number five will be it will remain to specific tissues having enough time in order for it to take effect and physiologically affect that particular anatomical site. And lastly, it should prevent mutation and uh, effectively combat a particular pathogen. Well, there are several ways on how a particular antibiotic or antimicrobial agent can do its work. Number one is by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. When we talk about cell wall synthesis, it's either that medication will have an enzyme that will break down the wall of the pathogen, making it susceptible to different members of our immune system, as well as inhibit an enzyme that will build that fortress, that wall around the cell. Imagine your cell as if it's a castle, then by destroying the outer walls of the castle that makes it vulnerable to different organisms, particularly your immunity, to combat that particular pathogen. Number two is that aside from its cell wall, with the destruction of its cell membrane, the tendency is it will alter the permeability of your particular pathogen. And as an effect, okay, a lot of fluid will come in and a lot of cellular contents will go out that will lead basically to cellular apoptosis or lysis. Next will be inhibition of RNA and DNA, which are the control centers of our microorganisms. Without that, there won't be enough uh, facilitation of different metabolic activity within the cell. Having that said, without metabolism, there will be no life. Anything related to metabolism will equate to life. That's why in the absence of RNA and DNA, within a, sp uh, a specific microorganism, there won't be life. Next will be protein synthesis, which is basically the building blocks of our RNA and DNA, thus affecting metabolism, also ultimately affecting life. And lastly, the uh, inhibition of different enzymatic activity that will again lead to inhibition of appropriate metabolical procedures within our cells or within the microorganism, thus inhibiting life itself. As I have stated a while ago, we can classify your antibiotics into two major classifications. Number one is bactericidal, meaning it commits or kills the particular bacteria or the particular microorganism. While bacteriostatic, from the word itself, it keeps the bacteria in place, inhibiting its growth. So those are the two major classifications of your antibiotics. Also, you can, well, classify antibiotics as well based from their capability to combat an array of microorganisms. For this matter, I'm talking about narrow spectrum, meaning specific, konti lang, limited lang ang kaya niyang patayin. However, despite of it being narrow spectrum, I should say that they are a little bit considered to be specialists. Meaning, kahit konti lang ang kinikator, they are specifically effective to this selected array of microorganisms. However, broad spectrum, on the other hand, can be a will be able to combat both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. However, their effectiveness towards a specific strain of microorganism will be limited compared to narrow spectrum microbiotic or antibiotics for that. As medical professionals, it's our uh, responsibility and an important consideration in our part that patients will not develop resistance to a particular uh, antimicrobial agent. I'm talking about the phenomenon of superbugs. When we say superbugs, you need to understand that the concept for microorganisms is that what doesn't kill them makes them stronger because if you are not able to completely eradicate that microorganism tendency is it will gain what you call resistance and when we talk about resistance dalawang bagay intrinsic and, ex and extrinsic resistance 
when we say intrinsic resistance, in the first place, that particular microorganism is already resistant. Wala nang effect sa kanya yung gamot na binibigay mo. Well, this is a matter of information and uh, uh, readings in your part. That you don't need to administer medications that will not have an effect to that particular microorganism. Example of which are medications that inhibit cell wall synthesis. Well, if your microorganism does not have a cell wall in the first place, what use do you have for a, part uh, for a medication that inhibits cell wall production? Wala. Kaya intrinsically resistant ang ating microbes sa pagkakataon niyo. You also have what you call extrinsic resistance. Ito yung kailangan nating pigilan. And there are several factors that we need to consider, especially us nurses, okay, in terms of antibiotics provision to our clients. Number one is what you call overprescription of antibiotics. Hindi naman kailangan yung antibiotics, pero pinaprescribe natin sa ating clients. However, because of that unprescribed and overuse of antibiotics, tendency is there will be tolerance in the part of your clients, thus gaining resistance to that particular medication. Where in fact, before you are feeling the therapeutic effects of these antibiotics, however, because of repetitive exposure to its active ingredient, tendency is we will be tolerant. And number two, microorganisms within our body might develop resistance due to familiarity to that particular medication. Number two, ito yung pinaka-common here in the Philippines. Patients tend to stop taking that particular medications when symptoms does not persist. This is not true for antibiotics. That's why doctors specifically prescribe a specified number of tablets or capsule, whatever that uh, uh, preparation will be, and specific numbers of days and provision per day per client is being given by our physician. Primarily because we would like again to completely eradicate the causative agent. Kaya it's an important nursing consideration for our clients, for us to educate them that disappearance of the symptoms will not equate us to terminate our intake of that particular medication. We need to finish the whole course or else microorganisms will develop resistance. And in the presence of resistance, we will not be able to use the same antibiotic again for our microorganisms, pathogens, will now be resistant to that medication. Wala na, hindi na magiging effective. Also, hygiene both in the hospital setup as well as the environmental sanitation should always be considered. And lastly, uh, poor or uh, slow development of new antibiotics catering for new strains of microorganisms will might lead to the development of what you call superbugs. There are several ways for us to combat uh, resistance in the part of our clients. Number one is for us to educate them, giving them enough uh, information on how, when, uh, are they supposed to take their medication specifically. This will prevent them for, uh, uh, or this will prevent uh, misinformation that might lead to poor compliance to treatment regimen. Number two will be patients should not pressure physicians requesting antibiotics. That as if they know really what's happening inside their system. Mind you, as physicians or clinicians for that matter, they are able to gasp a bigger picture on what really happens within your body. And aided by several laboratory exams, we are able to determine what particular medication should be effective for our client. In line with this, physicians on the other hand should not prescribe strong antibiotics uh, as first line of treatment, primarily because the weaker types of antibiotics will be rendered useless or ineffective. Also, we should avoid self-prophylaxis or simply taking medication for prophylact uh, prophylactic reasons without the approval of our physicians or clinicians. 
then uh, we should always destroy remnants or medications, antibiotics that were not taken all throughout the process because this will be ineffective and will might warrant uh, use of inappropriate amount of that particular medication. Unless prescribed by a physician, you should not do prophylactic treatment and as healthcare professionals should always make it to a point that our environment is completely or well clean or sterile if uh, uh, a scenario demands it to be. Things to consider when prescribing an antimicrobial agent, number one, is the actual records of your patient, determining if one is sensitive to that medication or not. Number two is age, whether a patient is too old or too young. There might be alteration in terms of the form, the dosage, and even the exact medication that we are providing our clients. Lifestyle and uh, comorbidities should always be considered because there are several medications that might have specific adverse reaction. Pregnancy also is an important consideration. Number next will be whether the patient is an inpatient or an admitted patient or an outpatient basis type of client because there are medications specifically those that are administered parenterally that demands a client to be admitted. Also, consider the area of affectation, specifically for the brain. For example, a medication does not cross the blood-brain barrier, then by all means, it will not be effective in combating neural uh, infections because it, it will not be able to reach its, its target site. That's why it will be rendered ineffective. The undesirable effects of antimicrobial agents are as follows. Number one, as what was specified a while ago, antigen-antibody responses might produce allergic reactions. Several al al allergic reactions can be treated pharmacologically. However, if remain untreated, uh, it might result to a debilitating condition we call anaphylactic shock wherein immediate pharmacologic and uh, therapeutic response should be given to these kinds of clients suffering from this kind of shock. Next will be toxicity. Toxicity in the four, uh, in a sense that all the medications that we are taking in passes through your liver for detoxification as well as metabolism. There are several medications combined to other medications or, well, if, if you take, uh, took it in large doses, might significantly cause hepatocyte damage, meaning liver damage. Kaya dapat nating uh, i-take note ang mga ganitong medication for prolonged excessive use of this medication might cause irreversible damage to several organs of the body. And lastly, super infections again. Because this uh, uh, antibiotics does not only target pathogenic cells, it might also uh, target our normal cells that might uh, lead to the destruction of our normal micro microflora. However, based from your understanding with your microbiology concept, your microflora is part of your innate immune system that inhibits uh, opportunistic pathogen from colonizing a particular anatomical site, thus protecting your body from some diseases. While prolonged use of antibiotics might kill these guards in our body that might predispose us or your client susceptible to different pathogens. Let's start with our first group of antibacterial or antimicrobial agents, which are your beta-lactam drugs, starting with your penicillin. When we talk about penicillin, as stated, it is considered to be a beta-lactam drug that is normally produced by antimicrobes or molds under the genus Penicillium, ergo the name. It is referred to as a beta-lactam drug pr primarily because of its chemical structure wherein the medication itself contains a beta-lactam ring. You need to understand that this beta-lactam ring makes penicillin effective to different microorganisms. However, specific microorganisms might produce what you call beta-lactaminase or penicillinase. Both of these are enzymes that are able to destroy that beta-lactam ring present in your penicillin, rendering it useless. That's why it's important for us to consider what kind of uh, infective agent is present among your clients. That's why always, whatever antimicrobial agent 
you are specifically using. A general consideration is that we need to have our patient under culture and sensitivity test. This is a laboratory procedure determining what is the causative agent and what particular medication is that microorganism sensitive to. Kaya yun lang ang ipeprescribe natin among our clients. Specific forms of your penicillin are as follows. Penicillin G was the first penicillin administered, administered both oral and parenteral. However, it was found out that it is not as effective primarily because it's only one-third or 33% of the total medication is being absorbed. Ergo, the bioavailability equal to 30%. There are two kinds of penicillin G. You have benzanthine as well as penicillin G sodium or potassium. You need to consider that pen G benzanthine is, be, uh, is law or has a longer uh, action. While your penicillin G sodium potassium from the word itself, it might cause severe or significant electrolyte changes if taken in a prolonged uh, period of time. Next will be your aqueous penicillin G, where before pen G is considered to be longer acting, your aqueous pen G has a shorter duration in terms of its effect. However, because of its aqueous solution, the water content, it's a little bit painful when injected to our clients. Ergo, the development of your procaine penicillin, which basically contains an analgesic or an anesthetic agent for that matter, which is considered to be longer acting. And number two, there is a decreased pain sensation up upon administering to our clients. We also have our penicillin V, which has better absorption compared to your pen G, which is one-third lang. Ngayon, two-thirds ang na-absorb. However, despite that advancement, it is said that penicillin G is less potent compared to your penicillin G. That's why penicillin G is more or commonly used compared to penicillin V. You also have what you call your broad-spectrum penicillin that does not only affect or caters those that are considered to be gram-positive, but also it is able and effective to combat both negative and gram-positive bacteria. However, because of them being broad in terms of their spectrum, yung potency nila compared to, well, specific gram-specific antibiotics is lesser. You also have what you call your anti-staphylococcal penicillin, which is penicillin resistant to what you call penicillinase. As what was explained a while ago, your penicillin is made up of a beta-lactam ring. And in the presence of penicillinase, or what you call beta-lactam beta lactaminase, that beta-lactam ring will be disoriented or destroyed, therefore rendering our chemical structure ineffective, thus the, total, uh, the totality of the medication is ineffective or is rendered useless as well. You also have anti-pseudomonal penicillin. It's a broad-spectrum penicillin that specifically is uh, developed in order to combat pseudomonas originosa. However, you need to understand that despite them being strong in nature, able to, con uh, to uh, uh, combat even pseudomonas, they are not resistant to penicillinase. Having that said, you have already an idea in your mind that penicillin okay, should somewhat come uh, with other medications that might inhibit the destruction of its beta-lactam ring. Comes the concept of uh, mixing them with what you call your beta-lactaminase inhibitor. Pipigilan natin yung sumisira sa beta-lactam ring. A common example of this are your solbactam, piperacillin, as well as your tazobactam. These beta-lactam drugs are specifically excreted to your, by, uh, to your kidneys via your urine. That's why general consideration for taking in penicillin is that you need to check for the kidney profile, the BUN and creatinine levels of our clients. Also, you need to understand that while taking penicillin, the effectivity of oral contraceptives is being decreased. Aminoglycosides should never be mixed with IV uh, solutions of penicillin, primarily because aminoglycosides and penicillin combats each other and activates each other, rendering both of them useless. 
and also you might want to check the bleeding parameters of your clients primarily because intake and uh, prolonged intake of penicillin might lead to uh, platelet aggregation problems uh, or it might decrease the ability of your client to coagulate thus promoting or giving risk for bleeding among our clients. Another beta-lactam drug is your cephalosporin, originally produced by what you call your cephalosporium acrimonium, ergo the name. It's identical in terms of its effect. It's also considered to be bactericidal and its structure is basically based on a beta-lactam ring as well. There are several generations for this particular medication. You have first, second, third, and fourth generation, even a fifth generation. You need to understand that first generation are specifically effective for gram-positive bacteria, specifically those considered staphylococcus or staphs, as well as streps. On the other hand, as we go along our uh, hierarchy, should I say, as you go to your second generation, it, it has increased activity uh, against gram-negative bacteria. Uh, on the other hand, it decreases its effectivity uh, to gram-positive bacteria. Your third generation, on the other hand, is very effective in combating both gram-negative as well as gram-positive bacteria. It's specifically developed to combat Pseudomonas activity. And your fourth generation, it's broad in terms of its effectivity and it's highly effective both to positive and gram-negative bacteria. General considerations when taking in cephalosporin is number one, when you are taking cephalosporin together with probenacid, you need to understand that it increases its effect, primarily due to the affectation of its excretion. Kaya kailangan yung i-consider ito kasi it increases the drug serum concentration within our body. Ergo, what will be your nursing responsibility? Regular monitoring of the drug serum concentration. And based from your understanding, when are you to take blood sample from your clients at the peak level of that particular medication. If probenacid increases its action, tetracycline and erythromycin, on the other hand, decreases its effect. Also, same with your penicillin, your cephalosporin decreases or might alter the clotting time of your patient. And if taken in large amounts, it might be considered highly nephrotoxic among our clients. Here is a PowerPoint presentation or a slide wherein it is shown the basic, it shows the basic groupings and classifications both of your penicillins as well as cephalosporins. As stated a while ago, both this medication alter cell wall synthesis, thus making the inner components of our cell escape through. Uh, ending, it will cause uh, lysis of our microorganisms thus their bactericidal effect. Now we tackle your macrolides. Your macrolides are considered to be broad-spectrum antibiotics that specifically inhibit cell protein synthesis. Without protein, there's no DNA, there's no metabolism, there is no life. Depending on the dosage, it can either be bacteriostatic or bactericidal in nature. Erythromycin is the most common uh, preparation under your macrolides. Well, when we talk about erythromycin, this is basically the drug of choice both for pneumonia caused by uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae or pneumonia or as well as Legionnaire's disease. Basic consideration when taking in macrolides are the following. Number one, it increases the effect of digoxin, carbamazepine, theophylline, cyclosporine, warfarin, as well as triazolone. Digoxin and carbamazepine have a narrow therapeutic range. Thus, as nurses, you need to understand that minute changes in terms of its drug serum concentration might produce toxic effect. Thus, your nursing responsibility will be regular monitoring of the drug serum concentration of your patient. On the other hand, your macrolides might decrease the effects of penicillins as well as clindamycins. That's why if used together or in a junk treatment, you might want to add additional dosage of your penicillin as well as your clindamycin. It should not be administered with clindamycin and lincomycin, specifically uh, clindamycin and lincomycin, primarily because it will compete to the attachment sites. With the competition of uh, its attachment side, the tendency is you will cause more drugs 
to not to take effect kasi hindi naman sila makakapenetrate sa target cell natin because again there will be competition on its receptor side there are also what you call your extended macrolide groups which will have longer half-lives usually due to their long half-lives these medications are administered uh, once a day only in order to facilitate excretion common examples are clarithromycin which is the first macrolide introduced after erythromycin also azithromycin and ditromycin usually these medications are taken in once a day for a duration of three to five days because if taken in prolonged period of time for example a week that might lead to what you call conjunctivitis that's why you would like to adjust to advise your patient to avoid wearing contact lenses during this period of treatment primarily for its perceived side effect next will be your lincosamides when we are talking about lincosamides it basically inhibits protein synthesis no protein no dna no life it can be bacteriostatic or bactericidal in nature, same with macrolides. You need to understand that when taking in lincosamides, it is incompatible with aminophilin, phenytoin, barbiturates, as well as ampicillin because they will simply render each other uh, medical component useless. Vancomycin, on the other hand, is a glycopeptide bactericidal antibiotics, which is specifically used for uh, resistant staphylococcus aureus. However, you need to understand that this medication is highly uh, nephrotoxic in nature. Thus, your nursing responsibility is to monitor the kidney profile, BU and creatinine. Also, prolonged treatment might cause damage to the auditory or vestibular branch of your cranial nerve number 8. Thus, it might result to uh, temporary or permanent deafness as well as temporary or permanent loss of balance. Examples of these medications are uh, quinopristine as well as televacine. As you can observe, vancomycin is specifically utilized for resistant strains of a particular microorganisms. Thus, if not life-threatening, as nurse or medical care providers, we would like to advise clinical uh, or clinicians as well as physicians not to administer this kind of antibiotics if not demanded by the scenario. Also, you need to uh, administer this medication in a slow IV infusion manner and not through bolus because you might experience what you call your Redman syndrome or redneck syndrome. If you have experienced this syndrome, you, would you should uh, terminate the provision, then administer uh, antihistamines or Benadryl in order to combat this is what you call redneck syndrome. Next will be your tetracycline. Your tetracycline is the first broad spectrum antibiotics, specifically effective to both gram positive and gram negative, as well as those microorganisms that cannot be identified if positive or negative. I'm talking about acid fast uh, straining, and these uh, microorganisms cannot be classified uh, with. Uh, gram positive and gram negative rendering some medications ineffective to them well tetracyclines will be a different case it's effective to mycobacteria rickettsia spirochete as well as chlamydia it's basically uh, a uh, bacteriostatic medication wherein it inhibits bacterial protein synthesis what you need to consider is that tetracycline should not be taken with magnesium, aluminum, antacids, milk containing uh, calcium, as well as iron containing drugs, primarily because it is highly, uh, uh, it easily attaches to these kinds of substances, thus uh, enabling them or, 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 or uh, making them unable to bind to different tissues of your body, thus rendering them ineffective. Next is for you to take in uh, this medication on an empty stomach to facilitate faster absorption. Anticipate a side effect of photosensitivity. That's why we are to advise our clients to avoid prolonged exposure to sunlight or sunbathing. When the client is pregnant, you should not take tetracycline during the first trimester, primarily because studies have shown that this has teratogenic effects. However, you are not to take tetracycline on the third trimester. Uh, uh, third trimester of pregnancy or even for patients that are below eight years old primarily because this might cause permanent staining of the teeth among your clients 
Also, you need to consider for tetracycline use that activity of penicillin given with tetracyclines can be decreased. That's why it might lead to the development of bacterial resistance, which according to our discussion should be avoided at all costs. Also, prolonged intake of uh, tetracycline paired with aminoglycoside might potentiate each other's effect and might increase the probability of it being nephrotoxic in nature. Well, kanina pa natin pinag-iusapan ang aminoglycosides. That's why we talk about aminoglycoside. Well, your aminoglycoside is a type of antimicrobial agent that inhibits bacterial protein synthesis. Walang protein, walang buhay, ergo the death of your microorganism. It is specifically used for gram-negative bacteria, namely your E. coli, Proteus, and even your Pseudomonas. Under this, kind, uh, under this classification of medication, you have gentamicin, tobramycin, and amikacin. However, pseudomonas is sensitive to gentamicin. Amikacin can be used if there are bacterial resistance both to gentamicin and tobramycin. However, being strong in nature, you need to consider the renal function, the dosage, as well as the age of your client because this medication is considered to be highly nephrotoxic. Also, it might lead to hearing loss. That's why assessment will be vital. Regularly or uh, every now and then, you need to check the hearing capability of your client, uh, changes in the patient's balance, as well as urinary output. Always keep the patient hydrated by taking in um, uh, approximately 2 mi or at least 2 ml of fluid and having an output uh, between 750 at least to 1,200 at least per day. You also have fluoroquinolones, which basically interferes with the enzyme DNA gyrase, which is vital for DNA synthesis. Their antibacterial spectrum includes both positive and gram-negative bacteria. Basic nursing consideration for your fluoroquinolones is that you need to increase fluid intake approximately 2,000 ml per day. Check that the urine output is adequate per day, 750 ml per day, as well as fluoroquinolones might increase theophylline level. That's why having the common knowledge that theophylline has a narrow therapeutic range, you need to closely monitor the drug serum concentration in order to prevent toxic effects. Fluoroquinolones can be useful in the treatment of your UTI, bone, joint infection, bronchitis, pneumonia, gastroenteritis, as well as gonorrhea. Next medication is, well, strictly not classified as antibiotic, primarily because it is not obtained in a biologic source. However, sulfonamides are effective antimicrobial agents by which inhibits bacterial synthesis of folic acid. Without the folic acid, a vital component of DNA and RNA synthesis, there will be no life. However, sulfonamides are said ineffective among viral and fungal infections among our clients. Example of this medication is your uh, sulfisoxazole or gantricin, which is effective when treating UTI. Also, it's good primarily because it's considered to be water-soluble. On the other hand, you have sulfadiazine, which is used in conjunction with uh, gantricin to treat rheumatic heart disease, speci uh, specifically for clients that are allergic to penicillin. A major consideration is that the side effect of taking sulfonamides is the formation of crystals in your urine that might impede the urinary tract. Ergo, having that said, you need to increase fluid intake to 2,000 ml per day uh, in order to facilitate adequate passage of urine. Increasing blood volume equals increase in glomerular filtration rate. Ergo, effective urination. Pipigilan mo ang crystal formation. You also have photosensitivity, thus uh, avoid sunbathing and prolonged expo exposure to sunlight as well as UV light, as well as cross-sensitivity. If you are uh, sensitive to one of these medications, tendency is, or there is a high tendency that you are allergic to the other one. You also have trimetoprim, an antibacterial agent that interferes similar to your the rest of your sulfonamides with the absorption of your folic acid which is effective for UTI that are caused by your Proteus, Klebsiella, as well as E. coli species. You have trimetoprim uh, administered together with sulfamethoxazole, which is given by or as a compound preparation. This specifically developed in order to prevent bacterial resistance uh, due to its combined synergistic effect. 
Usually, this is the drug of choice for treating pneumonia brought about by pneumocystis carini among our patients diagnosed with AIDS. Common side effects of your TMP, SMZ, or your trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is uh, anorexia, rashes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sto uh, stomat uh, stomatitis, crystal urea, as well as photosensitivity. However, utilizing medications or utilizing this medication, there are limited reports for adverse reactions. That's why, uh, yun yung kailangan lang natin i-consider. However, there are some forms, specifically uh, maffinide acetate as well as silver sulfadiazine, which are effective for treating burns among our clients. Punta naman tayo sa ating tuberculosis. When we talk about tuberculosis, it is basically caused by the acid fast bacillus mycobacterium tuberculae. And having that said, this specifically a dangerous microorganism that is, well, a little bit picky primarily because of its structure. Thus, we have specific identified medications, especially here in the Philippines, that we utilize to combat tuberculosis. Streptomycin is the first one being the first drug developed anti-TB. However, due to its highly autotoxic effect that causes vestibular dysfunction, deafness, combined with uh, nephrotoxicity, seldom it is used by itself alone in the treatment of tu tuberculosis. The most common medication used for treatment is your INH or your isoniazid. When we talk about isoniazid, this is the first oral preparation of an anti-TB mess that is considered to be effective. It inhibits cell wall synthesis, thus it is considered to be bactericidal. However, you need to consider that this medication while taking in blocks uh, vitamin B6 absorption. That's why nursing responsibility, dahil mahirap ang absorption ng B6 tendency is, we would like to advise our clients to take in vitamin B complex supplement. It is important for you to understand that when there is an exposure for patients that are diagnosed with TB due to its airborne capability to be transmuted, usually we are using these medications for prophylactic purposes. For family members that are exposed to positive clients, you need to take in isomycid for six months to one year. For HIV uh, patients due to their increased susceptibility, usually it re is required for you to take two months of rifampicin and pyrazinamide continuous uh, provision. You need to understand that when taking antitubercular drugs, that single drug treatment is rendered in or is considered to be ineffective for tuberculosis. That's why uh, it is important for us to explain to our clients that strict adherence to the treatment regimen is a must. Matagal lang gamutan kasi ang TB dots. Uh, that's why you need to uh, gain the patient's understanding that he or she should comply strictly to the treatment regimen. Five medications have been identified effective in combating your tuberculosis. You have your pneumonic ripes, rifampicin, uh, the, the side effect of rifampicin being that it's highly hepatotoxic and it might cause changes in terms of your urine, fecal material, saliva, sputum, sweat, tears. However, this is still considered normal. That's why no need to be alarmed and no need to talk to your physician and just inform your clients that red-orange changes in your secretions is expected when taking rifampicin. Pyrazinamide, on the other hand, might cause hepatotoxicity and hyperuricemia. Ethambutyl, letter E, eyes, nagkakaroon tayo ng tinatawag na optic neuritis. And lastly, or isoniazid, because of its ability to prevent B6 absorption, it might result to deficiency in vitamin B complex, thus peripheral neuritis. Next will be your antifungal agent. Well, uh, fungal infections is seldom experienced among our clients and is considered usually opportunistic in nature. Your antifungal agents or also known as your antimycotic agents are as follows. Number one, polyene. Under your polyene, you have your amphotericin B, the drug of choice for severe systemic fungal infection. It is highly monitored, specifically its drug serum concentration, primarily because of its narrow therapeutic uh, uh, range. Thus, minute changes equals toxicity. 
highly protein bound medication which is you uh, that's why it's usually staying in our physique for a long period of time and in addition to that only five percent of this medication is being excreted in our urine this medication is not absorbed in our GI, thus the prescribed preparation is through intravenous or uh, what you call your parenteral injections. Adverse reaction of this is that it's highly considered to be highly nephrotoxic and can cause electrolyte imbalance. Number two are your nystatins. Your nystatins are usually administered for candidial infections, both for your oral and topical region. For absorption in the GI, however, it can be used for intestinal uh, candidiasis due to direct contact of this medication to the area of uh, concern. It basically increases the cellular permeability, thus releasing the contents of your specific fungi, causing lysis and death. As a group inhibits cytochrome 450, pag pinag-usapan cytochrome 450, ang end na lang dyan is that there will be damage in the cellular membrane of your fungi, thus uh, making them susceptible from the outside environment. You also have your anti-metabolite flucosystine. The most, uh, most of the time, this is used in to, uh, together in conjunction with other antifungal agents. However, when used in this manner, you need to monitor for any possibility of toxicity due to its potentiative or uh, synergistic effect. Your fluorouracil or your flu, uh, uh, flu cytosine basically disrupts uh, the DNA and RNA synthesis, rendering our, anti or, uh, our microbial agents uh, ineffective, leading to death. You also have your antiviral agents. Itong mahirap for viruses or viral infection. Primarily because the virus being an obligate intracellular organism, they automatically find a host cell and bury themselves in order to facilitate replication of new uh, viruses. Your innate immunity together with your humoral immunity cannot detect uh, invasion of these particular microorganisms within our body. Thus, it's very difficult for us to detect viral infection. Pag nadidetect na to, madalas, the virus have been replicated adequately to cause several symptoms. The most important way to combat viruses or viral infection is through vaccination wherein we are introducing attenuated specimen, meaning pinahinang microorganism, enough to cause or to activate your antibody responses, while too weak enough to cause uh, specific clinical manifestations. However, you have specific antiviral medications that are developed nowadays. Number one will be Symmetrel and Flumadine, which is effective in treating uh, influenza A. However, you should watch out for symptoms of neural affectations when using this medication. Drug of choice for uh, cytomegalovirus is your Cidofovir. Your, excuse me. Your uh, foscavir, on the other hand, is, treat, uh, is used for treatment of herpes simplex infection among patients suffering from AIDS. You also have these topical antiviral medications as presented in our PowerPoint, usually used for herpes uh, simplex virus topically present. Meron din tayong tinatawag na neuromidase inhibitors. Your neuromidase inhibitors, basically your neuromidase, uh, decreases the rate wherein there will be release of newly developed viruses among its affected cell, thus shortening the symptoms giving enough or adequate time for the body to produce or to respond uh, using its humoral responses. The common medications that are commercially available uh, is Relanza as well as Tamiflu. Both of these medications are the only FDA-approved neuromin uh, neurominidase inhibitors. However, you should take it within 48 hours of confirmed um, symptom of flu because if you uh, took it above beyond 48 hours, the body have already adopted and have produced uh, antibodies for this particular pathogen. You also have immunoglobulins, which are basically antibodies that are being given to provide temporary immunity amongst our recipients. This will give them enough time to produce their own antibodies, while these artificial antibodies or immunoglobulin will act on their behalf while they are still manufacturing their defense mechanism. That's why it's important, especially nowadays, this is one of the treatment of choice locally if a patient has been infected with COVID-19. 
since COVID being the causative agent SARS-CoV-2, a virus, the body usually develops immunity with regards to this uh, virus. However, in the process uh, as it still is developing uh, the immunity, you need to prevent uh, further spread of this infection for this is highly uh, more uh, or causes uh, is related to a high fatality rate. Thus, okay, we need to uh, uh, provide supplements or, or, or uh, support the development of our antibody production by administering immunoglobulins. General considerations when taking in uh, antiviral medication is that you should monitor CBC, increase input and monitor your output, watch out for orthostatic hypotension, ergo extra care when assisting patients in moving up and about, as well as providing oral hygiene primarily because these antiviral agents uh, prolong exposure to this medication, especially in the oral cavity, might lead to gingival hyperplasia. You also have your anti-malarial drugs. Pag ng ating malaria, this is a tropical disease uh, brought about by the bite of a female Anopheles mosquito harboring plasmodium species. Over 50 ang ating plasmodium species, however, only 4 can cause malarial infection among our uh, clients, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or as of the moment. Uh, apat ang madalas natin kinoconsider. Number one is plasmodium malariae. Number two is plasmodium ovale. Number three is plasmodium vivax, which is the most common uh, plasmodium species present that causes uh, malaria. And last year, plasmodium falciparum, which is the uh, causative agent of the most severe form of malaria. There are basically three methods in order for us to eradicate or combat this disease. Number one, prophylactic treatment. What do you mean? Sir, for example, I am to go to Palawan, which is considered to be an area wherein malaria is rampant. You need to provide or to protect yourself by taking in anti-malarial drugs prior to going there. Also, you need to take it while you're in there and prior to your or upon, to, upon your return to your original place of origin. Number two is acute treatment of signs and symptoms. And number three, the prevention of relapse of this uh, disease. Medications under this is quinine and chloroquine. Uh, quinine being the first developed antimalarial drug and chloroquine, which inhibits malarial parasite by interfering its protein synthesis, are both effective in combating malaria. General considerations when taking antimalarial drug are as follows. If a patient is to visit a, a malarial-infested country, dapat na tumanggap ka ng prophylaxis. You are to take it with meals due to the possibility of a GI upset and avoid consuming large amounts of alcohol for it might, absor uh, it might uh, alter or affect the rate of absorption of this particular medication. Last antimicrobial agent will be your anti-helminthic. Pag pinag-usapan natin ng helminths, technically it can be considered or cannot be considered as uh, solely a microbial, microbe for that matter because a lot of uh, helminths are already visible to the naked eye. However, it is included in this set of discussion primarily because it can combat or inhibit the growth of this microorganism. The most, uh, most common site of helminthiasis is within your intestine. However, it can metastasize or spread through your lymphatic system, blood vessel, as well as liver. That's why you need to combat this using your anti-helminthic drugs. Depending on your causative agent, the following will be effective. Uh, this will be the following medication effective to this uh, specific causative agent. General consideration well, when taking anti-helminthic medication is that okay, it might cause GI distress. That's why you are to take it with uh, food. It might result to dizziness, weakness, headache, as well as drowsiness. That basically ends our discussion for our antimicrobial agents. Once again, this is Jonas saying that learning should always be a fun experience. Once again, good day everyone and always keep safe. God bless.